13, verse 12, says, So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area, area excuse me, were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Listen, this morning, before we dive into the word, word uh, I want to again just thank those who are a part of feeding those in need and the homeless yesterday. I know we already said thank you. And we already talked about that during announcements, but now that we are on, on Facebook and on live stream, uh, what some of us might not be aware of, we have a lot of people that attend the church online because they live in different places or different states and they're not here in our community uh, and those individuals give and support the church and the work of ministry in the church so we want to thank obviously everybody in person that played a part but those online as well those listening later as well that that played a part in in donating specifically to feeding the homeless and donated specifically for us to do this and have been praying for this uh we just want to say thank you to everybody and so I want to take a second to say that, uh, that there are just as much of those 70 meals that we pre prepared as the rest of us. And so I wanted to include those online listening later as a part of that praise, uh, because together we did a lot yesterday. Praise God for that. So this morning, I want to direct our attention to someone in scripture uh, who doesn't typically receive much attention. And it's probably because his story is crazy. We're not going to get into all the details of his story, but if you want in your own time this week to read through the passages of Genesis, say 12 or 13, all the way to 18 or 19, you will read of some crazy things that happens to an individual that we're going to talk about today. So to give the story surrounding this individual in Genesis 12, God gives a man by the name of Abram, later called Abraham, as we probably are more used to him, instruction to leave the land of his father and go to a place that God would reveal to him. And so Abraham does what God says and ends up in the land of Canaan, the land that, that God would promise to eventually give to Abraham and all of his descendants and the generations to follow. But the Bible tells us that while he's there, a famine hits the land and they're forced to go to Egypt. Now, after some time in Egypt, Abraham and those with him leave. But Abraham isn't actually the person. I'm trying to throw you off there for a minute. Isn't the person we're actually going to focus on. The Bible says that Abraham has this nephew named Lot. And through this journey, the nephew Lot goes with Abraham everywhere he goes. So the Lord tells Abraham to leave the land of his father. Lot goes with him. When he ends up in Canaan, Lot is with him. When he has to go to Egypt because of the famine, Lot is with him. And now that they're able to leave Egypt, we see that Lot again is with him. And the Bible tells us that both Abraham and Lot had grown very wealthy in their travels. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a problem that if the Lord would so incline, I'm willing to try to solve in my life, right? Like the, the problem is that they were too wealthy and they had too many sheep and flocks and cattle and herdsmen and servants and wealth, like big bummer there for Abraham and Lot. They had so much they didn't know what to do with. And so the Bible says the land couldn't contain the two of them living so close together. There wasn't enough resources for them to be so close together. And even their herdsmen they started to, to fight each other over everything. And so Abraham says to Lot, he says, we can't stay together anymore. We have grown too large for this. And so you look out across this vast countryside. Look to the east and to the west. Look to the left and to the right. Look at all of the land and you choose where you want to go and set up your family. Where you want to take all of your wealth and your belongings and your generations to live. And so Lot looks over this land. And Abraham says, if you pick the land to the right, I'll go to the left. If you pick to the land to the left, then I'll go to the right. And so Lot decides that he will pick the most favorable, the most well-watered, the most lush, the best-looking piece of land, and he chooses to go there. And so Abraham just accepted and went with the leftover land. And that's where we pick up our story again. We're going to read our opening passage again, Genesis 13. Verse 12 and 13 says, So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. Pay attention to verse 13. But the people of this area 
were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. So Lot finds himself living on the outskirts of an extremely wicked place. He sets up his tents near Sodom, just outside of town. So with the help of the Lord, I want to preach a message this morning that I'm titling, Living on the Edge. Living on the Edge. Let's pray together one more time this morning. Father, as we always pray, and we, we try to be faithful to pray it every Sunday, Lord, I pray that it's not not my words right now, but Holy Spirit of God, it is your words that are spoken today. And Holy Spirit, you would do the miracle that only you can do, that we would hear those words in the way that we need to hear them individually today. Let them land in our spirit how we need to hear them in our lives today, God. Help us to apply it in the way that we need to apply it in our lives, for our journey, for our walk today, Father. Lord, would you just speak to us so individually that would leave here thinking that message was for me today. But let us all leave feeling that way because you would speak to us in such a specific way today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I mean, now before we get too deep in this today, I want to point out what humility did in the life of Abraham. Maybe, maybe, maybe you saw that. Abraham humbly gives his nephew Lot first pick, even though some of the land looked better. And Abraham could have easily taken that land that looked better for himself, but instead he prefers his nephew and gives him first pick. Look what happens in verse 14. It says, after Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. 16. I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction from giving it to you. Now the Bible says that when we exalt ourselves, we will be humbled. But when we humble ourselves, that God will exalt us. Abraham's humility positioned him in a place of blessing. Did you catch that? He, he offers Lot first pick and is willing to humbly accept whatever is left. Abraham made it about Lot, and so God made it about Abraham. And so humility positioned Abraham in a place of blessing. On the other side of the story, Lot's selfishness and pride positioned him on the edge of wickedness. And the same exact things can happen in our lives. When we walk the path of humility, the destination is typically blessings from God. But when we walk the path of pride and selfishness, the Bible tells us that the destination is typically destruction. And maybe you've experienced that. Maybe, maybe you've, you've had a moment in life where you have humbled yourself and preferred somebody else, but then God suddenly turns around and blesses you. Or maybe you've been in a place or a position where you've decided I'll be self-seeking and I will do what, what is better for me without thinking of anybody else around me. And then you suddenly find it to come and kind of bite you on the tail side. I jokingly have told this story before of, of pulling up to a Chick-fil-A line one time. And, and Chick-fil-A and all their efficiency, they're, they're the only place that has mastered the two lines at the same time going through a drive through Right, that's what you get when you go to the Lord's Chicken. And so I remember pulling up one time, and I was in the middle lane just before it was going to expand into two, and I could take my pick. And in my head, I kind of I thought, I'll go left, and I kind of even turned my tires that way, but I was still in the single lane part, so I wasn't, I wasn't cutting anybody off. I was still making my choice. But I see the right side start moving quicker. So I heard and cut my my wheels the other way, even though I had committed to the left, and I'd kind of just weasel my way to the right, thinking, I will go in the faster lane, because apparently I'm more important than the person behind me, and me making better time today is more important than them making better time today. And so when I did that, it kind of cracked me up that the two cars in front of me decided to pay with cash. There's nothing wrong with paying with cash. I'm just of a generation that I'm used to just paying with card. I know the numbers, the numbers in my bank account, the numbers are on my phone, the numbers are in my head. I'll pay with card. My dad is of the generation of paying with cash. And if he can't pay with cash, he's kind of frustrated about that. 
And so it must have been two people like my dad in front of me. They're paying with cash and not exact change. And so you, you, you get what I'm saying. It was taking a long time. And sure enough, the car behind me that went in the lane that I should have picked ended up in front of me. And I was like, Lord, I deserved that. I deserved to, to, to have that happen to me when I was being selfish over, over getting my daggum chicken about 30 seconds sooner than, than it would have anyways. How silly, right? But we see that happens in our life. Humble ourselves and God exalts us. Exalt ourselves and God humbles us. Make it about other people and God makes it about us. Make it about ourselves and that's the prize that we're left with and that's not very good of a prize. So Lot pursues his own interests and picks what is seemingly the better land. But that land is positioned on the edge of the wicked and sinful city of Sodom. So the story continues, and Abraham and Lot go their separate ways, and, and a lot happens in the chapters that follow. If you want to read that this week, you will think that you are watching uh, some, some version of a soap opera mixed with Maury Povich with a touch of Jerry Springer. That is the story of Lot and Abraham in their early days when you read up to about Genesis 20. I'm just being honest. I was reading it the other day and looked at my wife and just started going, Jerry, Jerry. Like, it was, it was some crazy stuff that I was reading that, that I've read before, but reading Again, I'm going, dear Lord, how did you even put all this together, God? Because we are some messed up people. Listen, go home and read it this week. And I'm sure you won't text me going, Pastor, you weren't, you weren't kidding. Like, like the DNA test came back on Maury and like, he was the father. That was crazy stuff. So war breaks out in the region and Lot finds himself in danger as he's kidnapped and his family is kidnapped. All of his possessions are kidnapped and captured. Because the people attacking Sodom go to the valley and they just capture Lot too. The Bible says a servant escapes and runs to Abraham and says, your nephew has been captured. So Abraham, like a hero in the story, pulls together some of his own trained men and goes on a rescue mission where he brings Lot and his family back. But see, there's a point weaved in all of this and that is that bad things can happen. When we're trying to live on the edge of wickedness or sin. And you might be thinking, Pastor, what are you talking about living on the edge? What are you talking about living on the edge? Here's what I mean this morning. There are things in life that we know to be wrong. There are things in life that we know to be sin. There are things in life that we know to be evil. And chances are, we do our best not to cross those lines. You tracking with me? We, we do our best not to live in those cities, if you will. Like Lot didn't just move into Sodom. He moved on the outside and the outskirts of town. We avoid big sins like murder or adultery, or stealing, like, like you name it. We, we don't cross those lines. We don't live in those, those cities. But what I feel impressed of the Lord for us to look at today is how often do we live on the edge? Now listen, we know that, that we would probably never murder. <clears throat> but how often are we harboring hatred and unforgiveness towards people when Jesus said, that's like already committing murder in your heart. Now, I'm not proposing that those things would lead us to crossing the line in that way. But sometimes we live in this false comfort in our lives because we're not living in the bad and wicked cities. Is, is this making sense this morning? We feel this false sense of comfort because, well, I'm just living on the outskirts of the really, really bad things. I'm not doing the really bad things. We're just living close enough to, to feel the heat without getting burned, if you will, right? Like, we don't murder. We just have bitterness, vengeance, and resentment building in our heart. So we think we're okay. Because we're just outside of town. We don't lie. We just are not completely forthcoming with the full truth of the story. So we think we're safe and okay. Because, again, we're only living on the edge. It's just a little cussing in my movies. It's just a little nudity in my shows. It's just a little bad lyrics in my music. It's just a little alcohol. It's just a little second or third glance at the attractive person walking by. It's just a little white lie or fib. It's just a little gossip or really just oversharing because I was excited about the story. 
it's just a little worry. It's just a little outburst of anger. I mean, it's, it's just a little punch in a pillow or a wall. It's not a person. It's not that bad, right? It's just a few dollars in a slot machine. I mean, Lot wasn't living in the wicked city, in the sinful city, right? Like he was just living on the edge. So what's such a big deal about that? But sometimes we think that, that we are safe to live our lives in the same way. You may not be living in adultery, but, but what do you do when your coworker flirts with you? You might not be living in drunkenness, but, but what substance do you need just a little bit of to get a little high or a little low to help cope with life because it's hard when really Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit should, should be what we need to fill every emotional void in our life? You might not be a violent person. You may never have beat somebody. But what words come out of your mouth when someone cuts you off in traffic or they don't use their turn signal? Listen, this, this, the small things matter. Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15, says, Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Daggum, little foxes are cute. You ever seen one? It wasn't that long ago that on our doorbell that we have over at the house, we had motion detected at the back door, which that will just scare the fire out of you at about midnight when that goes off. I open up my phone every night expecting to be some big burly son of a gun that I got to pray and go like throw cuffs with, like trying to get in the house. And instead it's like, it's a cat. And I'm like, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> never mind. That's, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. But one night, this blur shot across the thing. We're like, what was that? It was a fox on our back porch. I was like, that was pretty awesome. No wonder we hadn't seen the cats in a few days. He found himself a drive through Just kidding, the cats are back. Everything's safe. But notice that this verse identifies the little foxes. The little foxes. The big foxes are intimidating, right? Like, don't, you don't want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one. But the little foxes are cute. They're harmless. They're, they're little. They're insignificant. It doesn't mean anything. It's a little fox. I've heard it said that the big foxes are tall enough that they can eat the fruit of the vine or the plant. But the little foxes are too short. And therefore, they eat the vine itself, killing everything. So it's saying, we, we may look out for the big things in life, but in doing so, we miss out on the little things, or we don't pay attention to the little things in life that are literally eating away all of our life. Listen, these little things can become habits, and habits then can begin to shape our character. The Bible says, and we know that a little yeast can work through the entire dough, or the whole dough. I heard a story one time that there once was a mother of, of a young child trying to teach the same lesson. She was trying to teach him this, this same lesson. And so while he was off playing one day, she made him his favorite chocolate chip cookies. The young boy could smell the cookies baking while he was in his room. He thought, oh my Lord, what, what did I do to deserve this? Mom is making my favorite chocolate chip cookies and I can smell them and I'm excited. So she pulls out the cookies and the young boy comes running up and she offers him son. But, but before he takes a bite, she says, hey, you can smell. These are your favorite. And I want you to know I made these extra, extra, extra special today for you. And he's like, yeah, like, well, okay. She said, I put in extra butter. Now, listen, if, if you all know cooking, you know, like anything is better with extra butter in it. She said, I put extra sugar in it. And he's like, yeah. I put extra chocolate chips of it. And he's like, you did? Like, really? He is like chomping at the bit to take the cookie. And then she embellishes the story a little bit. And she says, and while you were playing, I went outside and I even found some chocolate of the dog variety from the yard and I put it in the cookies for you. And as you can imagine, the young man is shocked and horror and is like, you what? He no longer wanted his special favorite cookies. But his mother reassured him. She said, no, 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 son, there's a ton of butter. There's a ton of sugar. There's a ton of chocolate chips. There's a lot in this cookie to enjoy. Most of this cookie is good. Most of this cookie will not hurt you. Most of this cookie you will love and enjoy. But there's the, only a little bit of the dog's special ingredient. So what's the problem? The boy still refused. 
And the mother explained her point to him. Even the smallest amount of the wrong ingredient can ruin the entire batch. See, the small things matter in our life. The Bible says not to give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. A foothold is like a tiny crevice where a, where a climber can put their foot in to give them momentum, to give them footing and their climb on their journey. And so if the little things in life aren't God honoring, we're basically carving out little places in our heart, little places in our mind, little places in our soul where the devil can just wiggle his toes in and begin to climb in our life. Back in the youth ministry days before Spotify and before uh, uh, YouTube music and Apple music, I used to tell our students, you show me the last 25 most played songs on your iTunes playlist this last week and I will tell you the mood that you been in and they're like that's impossible there's no way and so they start showing me the songs and I start looking at the lyrics of the songs and one by one I'm like yeah yeah, yeah. you you obviously had a bad breakup and you're depressed and you're feeling this way you were angry this week weren't you you were this way how did you know this because because what you're putting in is riddled with all of it right the, the things that we watch the things that we take in, the things that we listen to, the conversations we allow ourselves to stay inside of, right, with people. Th these are all little things that if they're not God-honoring, we're just chiseling little pieces out of our heart, little pieces out of our mind, little pieces out of our soul, and we're saying, you know what, devil, go ahead and wiggle your toe in, and, and that gives you a footing to climb in my life and mess with my life. Listen, the Bible makes it clear that we're not to live on the fence, playing the holy hokey pokey where you got one foot in in Jesus and one foot still in the pleasures and the desires of selfish self. The Bible says that if we're lukewarm, God will spit us out of his mouth. Listen, living on the edge of wickedness, entertaining our pet sins or small sins or small prideful, selfish indulgences that don't honor God, it's a risky and it's a scary game to play. After Abraham rescued Lot, more time goes by, and eventually, it's a story that we might be more familiar with, where God himself appears before Abraham with two angels, but in human form. Abraham's excited. He asks them to stay. They prepare food. They spend time together. And in that story is where God says to Abraham, Sarah is going to become pregnant. And this is the fulfillment of what I have promised you of your descendants. And so Genesis 18 now, verse 20, it says, So the Lord told Abraham, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. This, this is moments before God was going to leave Abraham. He says, I'm going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I have heard. If not, I want to know. 22, the other men turned and headed toward Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. So Abraham then pleads with God. He says, well, 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 hold on, hold on, God. You're about to go down and judge the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, but, but, but what, if, what if you find 50 righteous people, God, that live there? Surely you wouldn't destroy the whole city and destroy the 50 righteous people too, because that wouldn't be just or fair to them. And so God says, if I find 50 righteous people, then I will spare the city. Abraham says, Lord, since you've already allowed me to speak, permit me to speak again. If you find 45 righteous people, will you spare the city? The Lord says, I will, I will spare the city. Abraham is negotiating like he's at a flea market. He says, Lord, since you've already permitted me to speak twice, if you would allow me to do it one more time, if you would find only 40 people in the city, Lord, would you not save the city? The Lord says, I'll save the city. Well, Lord, since I've already spoken a few times, I'm going to keep going. Uh, if there's 30, and the Lord says, okay. If there's 20, the Lord says, okay. Finally, Abraham says, Lord, you're putting up with me, and I appreciate it. So just one more time. Lord, if you would just find 10 righteous people in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, would you spare the city? And the Lord says, I will not destroy the city if I can find 10 righteous people. In Sodom and Gomorrah. But why is Abraham 
so worried about Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not even anywhere close necessarily to where he lives or he set up his establishment for his family. And the last we saw, old little Lot was living on the outside of town. Look at Genesis 19 verses 1 and 2. It says, that evening, the two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. Woo, look who's there. Lot was sitting there. And when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. Then he welcomed them and bowed down with his face to the ground. Lot recognized something was going on here. My lords, he said, come to my home to wash your feet and be my guests for the night. You may then get up early in the morning and be on your way again. Isn't it interesting that when the angels go to the entrance of the city of Sodom, and there, there's our good old buddy Lot. He, he's, he's not just living on the edge anymore. He's now suddenly sitting at the entrance. He's at the city gates. And as we're going to read here in a moment and find out, he's, he's actually living in town now. He's changed the addresses now. Sin is a slippery slope in our life. Compromise is a slippery slope in our life. Living on the edge of the city can fade and drift into living in the city. Living on the edge of sin can quickly become living in sin. Entertaining your temptations and trying to live on the line will eventually turn into you crossing the line. James chapter 1 verse 14. James lays it down for us. He says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. See, there's a progression where the city we've been circling suddenly becomes the city that we're living in. And that's why we need to close the door to compromise. That's why we, we need to, to choose the land far away from sin and wickedness. That's why we need to be careful who we're close to. That's why we need to be careful of the places that we go and the things that we watch and the things that we say. Because living on the edge of sin can become living in sin. That's why we got to pay attention to the small things. So Lot convinced the angels to stay in his home. And once he got them there, the Bible says that every man in the city, young and old, surrounded his house and demanded he bring out the two men so that they could all have relations. For those listening online or in person, I'll say it that way. But we know what that means. All the men of the town, young and old, wanted to have relations with the two men. And so Lot tried to plead with the men of the town by going outside and saying, You guys cannot do this. Don't do this. Please stop. Leave. Go away. But the mob gets so aggressive that the angels had to pull him back in the house. And they blinded the men of the town so that they would finally leave. Oh, help me, Holy Spirit of God. I, I don't want to go here. We see a city in this story gripped with sexual sin of a very specific type. And when the men of the city started giving themselves over to this, it, it enraged the entire city to the point where an enraged mob surrounded the house and said, it's not enough for us to be in this, but we want those two men to come out and be in this. Listen, understand that's what a spirit of sexual perversion does. So when certain groups with certain agendas start saying, we'll turn your children as well. Or when certain groups with certain agendas start changing the name of pedophilia to minor attraction or some other crap. We have to understand spiritually that it's not just a matter of, oh, I don't like that you like 
like a certain person, or I don't love that you love a certain person, or I don't, it's, it's not us trying to change someone's preferences. It's realizing a spiritual driving force that's oppressive, and that's, that's, that's possessive even, that's steering and pushing all of it. An enraged mob of men are surrounding the house. And Lot does something even so crazy that he says, I have two virgin daughters that I'll give all of you men and you can do whatever you want with. Disgusting. I have a hard time stomaching the story sometimes. Every time. I can't stand it, truthfully. But in such a spirit of perversion, they said, no, no, give us the men instead. And I realize some people listening might not like the tone of the message right now. But we have to understand the spiritual significance. If we blind ourselves to the spiritual significance, it's like walking around with no eyeballs. And this wave of spiritual oppression and perversion falls over the city and they give themselves over to it. And the enraged mob is so crazy that they tell Lot, we'll do worse to you if you don't let us at the two men inside the house. So the angels pull Lot back inside to rescue him. And the Bible says the angels made all the men turn blind. So that eventually they just left to go home. The angels saw enough. And they informed Lot. They said, listen, we, we, we've seen enough. We are surely going to destroy the city. The city has given itself over to wickedness and sin and perversions. And so we're going to destroy the city. So go get your relatives and get out of Dodge as quick as you can. So Lot goes to his daughter's fiancés. But Doug, they say, man, that's a funny joke. You old silly Lot, you. They don't believe him. So the Bible says that, that the next day, the next day, Lot decides to sleep on it. He decides to lay his head on his pillow in slumber. The Bible says the next day, Lot wakes up, and he's still hesitant. And that's what sin does in our life. At first, we're just on the outskirts of it. And we're like, man, that, that, that looks good. I'll, 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 I'll feel the heat of it, but I'm going to get burnt because I know it's wrong. But I'm just living on the outside of it. Then suddenly, we find our zip code changed. And we're like, how in the mess did, did I move to the city? I'm a country boy. And here I am in the city. I'm not actually, but you're like, I already know that, Pastor. Thank you. But then even when you know it's about to be destroyed and life's about to fall apart and crumble, you're in so deep that you say, I don't know that I really want to leave, though. The Bible says that the angels finally just grab Lot and his wife and his daughters by the hand and rush them out of the city. Because the Lord was merciful to him. Aren't you thankful that God is merciful to you? We can read this story and be like, this is some messed up, crazy junk. And it is. But we can also look at our lives and go, that's some messed up, crazy junk. And it is. Thank God for the mercies of God. Verse 17 of Genesis 19. It says, when they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley escape to the mountains or you will be swept away oh no my lord lot babe come on lot you have been so gracious to me and saved my life and you've shown me such great kindness but i cannot go to the mountains disaster would catch up to me there and i would soon die verse 20 see there's a small village nearby Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. All right, the angel said, I will grant you your request. I will not destroy the little village. you got to be kidding me, Lot. After all of that, he is still compromising and wouldn't follow what he's being told. The angels say, don't stop anywhere in the valley or you'll be swept away. But he says, well, but I don't want to just not stop in the valley. I want to live in the valley. And he tries to justify it by saying, but it's just a small town. It's just a, it's just a little town. 
It's just a little fox. It's just a little sip. It's just a little look. It's just a little whatever it is that can lead to something huge and destructive in our life. Verse 23. Lot reached the village just as the sun was rising over the horizon. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 25, he utterly destroyed them along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. Verse 26, but Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him and she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, this is just my theory. I don't claim to know the geography or the topography of the area. I don't see this in Scripture. This is my theory. But if Lot had chose to escape to the mountains as instructed, he may not have been close enough to the city for his wife to have looked back as they were not instructed not to have done. But even with destruction written on the walls, Lot still chooses to live on the edge. So Lot's wife looks back and is turned into a pillar of salt. Then she became a salt block. Jesus in Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 5 rather calls us the salt of the earth. But we know that salt isn't effective when it hardens. Have you ever grabbed a salt shaker? And, and try to use it, but when you do, it's just, it's just a solid rock, right? It's just hardened inside of the container, and, and no salt is going to come out of it because it's seasoned. It's seized up, rather. It's hard. Nothing comes out. It's useless. It doesn't do anything. So when I thought about that, I thought, well, how does salt harden? How does salt harden? How does, it, how does salt get to a place where it becomes like a rock like that and it's actually a very easy answer when salt absorbs moisture from the air it hardens that's it that's it that's why you see some salt shakers with rice inside you ever seen that because the rice will absorb more moisture than the salt will allowing the salt to still be free flowing and to be salt but that's how it happens salt hardens when it simply absorbs moisture from the air now go with me on this What's interesting to me is that we know that too much water simply dissolves salt, right? You, you ever pour salt into water and see it dissolve? Maybe you got a sore throat, which I rebuke in Jesus' name, and you get some, some hot water and put some salt in it, and you do some gargling. Or if you were like me growing up, you said, Dad, I'll get you a nice glass of water, but first you put salt in the bottom of it and then give it a good stir and give him him some salty water like I just wanted to bless you with the taste of the ocean dad that's all it was too much water too much water and the salt just dissolves immerse the salt in the water and it dissolves go with me stay with me right now again we know that living in wickedness and sin will dissolve our lives it's obvious salt in a lot of water it dissolves our life steeped in sin, our life dissolves. But when salt is merely around or exposed to moisture, with, which is in the air, when the salt is not sealed properly, when the salt is not stored where it should be stored or how it should be placed or how it should be positioned or how it should be sealed or protected, the salt absorbs the water, becoming hard and unusable. And it's the same way for us living on the edge. If you just put salt in a salt shaker on your counter away from your sink, it looks like that salt should be safe because it is not submerged in water. But because it's living unprepared and unsealed properly and without the right things inside of the salt to keep the salt healthy and safe, it just being in the presence of the moisture in the air causes it to harden. And the same thing happens in our life when we're living on the edge. 
Man, so how do we hedge ourselves? How do we insulate ourselves? How do we prevent this from happening in our life or stop this if we notice it is happening in our lives? We have to remember how the journey started for Lot. His life was all good and prosperous and blessed and favored and growing when he spent all that time going where Abraham was going, which is where God was instructing him to go. But he got himself into this mess by allowing pride and selfishness to take control when he decided to pick the better land. Look at Micah chapter 6 verse 8. It says, no, old pe- no, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. See, when, when, when you are walking humbly with God where you pursue his desires over your desires and indulgence, he will lead you to a better land. If you find yourself living on the edge, dipping your toes into dangerous waters, humble yourself before God. Pursue his desires. Pursue pursue the, the things that satisfy God rather than pursuing the things that satisfy you. Pursue things that are pure or lovely or worthy of thinking on. And as you do that, you will naturally find yourself moving further and further away from living on the edge. Listen, I am all for us having healthy boundaries. Listen, we have to set up some healthy boundaries in our life. We, we have to set up some, some good property lines that say, I don't go any further than that. I stay. This I hedge myself. I have people in my life that that keep me accountable. I have a strong prayer life. I read the word. I spend time with Jesus. Like we need to do all of those things in our life. Have people that we have a relationship with where we can say, "Hey, man, I'm struggling with something. Can you pray with me? I've been living on the edge of this, and I can feel temptation knocking at my door, and I feel myself drifting this way a little bit. Can, can you can you spend some time with me, or talk with me, or just let me talk to you and vent, and you can pray? Like we need we need those types of things in our life to hedge us in and protect us. But naturally, if 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 living on the edge is here, but God is there, the more I just naturally try to go towards the things that God has and live in a way that's holy and live in a way that's righteous and pursue the things of God and pursue his desires. And I'm walking in humility. That takes humility in our life. It's humility to say, God, not my will, but your will be done. It's humility to say less of me, God, and more of you. It's humility to say, I have temptations and desires that I want to pursue for self, for self satisfaction, but, but God, I'm going to humble myself and think of myself less and think of you more more and pursue what you have for me. But the more we do that and the closer we, we go towards God in our pursuit of that, the further away we end up from living on the edge. I want to give us this last scripture before we pray this morning. And I want us to pray together with those online, those here in person. So we're just going to say, we're going to pray together at the end of this service. James chapter 4, verse 7. James tells us, so humble yourselves before God. Listen, if, if, if you today are saying, Lord, I don't want to live on the edge. Help me not get to that place. Then I, I want you to, to, to go home this week and maybe once a day. Here, here's a challenge for our church, for those listening online or listening later. Read James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, for once a day this whole week and, and see what that does in your life. So humble yourselves. This is the roadmap out of living on the edge. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Verse 9. Let there be sorrow and, and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up in honor. Humility in our lives leads to holiness in our lives. I want us to pray together.
If listen, if, if this, if this, if the word from the Lord today has gripped your heart in any capacity, and again, I want this moment and this opportunity for those here in person, for those online, for those listening later. If this word has gripped your heart in any way, shape, or form today, and the Lord is speaking to you, or maybe there's conviction, or he's calling you out of some places, or protecting you from going into some places, reminding you of some situations or circumstances, then listen, this, this moment is for us to pray together. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word today, Father. Lord, we thank you for, for you sounding the alarm in our life. Lord, I believe this word today, God, might be a warning for some of us that hear it. Lord, maybe there are some areas where we can see that we're living on the edge. Lord, maybe there's some areas in our life where we would like to. And maybe our toes are getting a little bit too close to the fire. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would allow this word to be a wake-up call for us today if we need it to be one. So Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would touch us today. You would help us today. Lord, I don't want anyone leaving condemned in this place, Father. You didn't give this word today for us to leave condemned and feeling like we're hopeless because maybe this word was for us today. God, instead, I pray that we would leave knowing that you love us so much that you never give up on us, you never forsake us, you never leave us alone, that you spent some time with us today giving us a word that will produce life in our life. Thank you for caring about us so much that you would produce life in our life. Thank you for loving us enough that you would produce life in our life. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your favor that you would produce life in our life. And so, Father, I pray today, Lord God, that we would use your word as a roadmap, that we would humble ourselves before you, that we would resist the devil and see him flee. God, that we would come close to you and see you come close to us. God, that we would wash our hands and purify our hearts, that our loyalty would be to you. God, that there would be tears for the things we've done and sorrow and grief for the sins we've committed. But God, I pray that that, that would all turn and that we would humble ourselves before you, that you would lift us up, Heavenly Father. So Father, thank you for loving us so much and caring about us so much, God, that you give us a word to help us in this life that is for our betterment and for our good. So Father, we love you. We bless you. God, we thank you for your kindness over us. I just pray right now, Father, a blessing over every person hearing these words today, tomorrow, next month, whenever they're listening to this message, God, that your hand of blessing would be upon them in this exact moment, this exact season, Lord God, that they would find themselves to be more than a conqueror, that they would find themselves to be the head, not the tail, above and not beneath, being able to do all things to Christ Jesus, who gives them strength, Father. And we just declare that no weapon formed against them will prosper, Lord, according to your word today, God and your riches, and your goodness, and your blessing. And Lord, to this we say a resounding amen. Amen.